Good morning. Hello, Happy guys. Sunday. Welcome. Morning. Okay. Ava. No, no, no. Ava, us. don't spray ya. Oh, wait. <laughs> Ava. Thank you for joining us. Hope everyone is well. It's holiday. School holiday. School holiday. Kids are happy. It's only a week. Still, it's still a week, then. Eh? Better than nothing. Gaga is, is not saying anything, she's just watching us. Hello, Gaga. Hey, Gaga. Good morning. Isabel, good morning. Hello, Isabel. Good morning, Lynn. Uh -uh. Ava, stop eating here, that thing. Shiva. Hello, runners. Oh, Ooh. the we're pain. Not, we're not talking about that today. Yeah. Morning, Are Lindy. we? We are going to talk about it. No, we can. You must tell them what happened to you. I'm fine. <laughs> We had our half marathon yesterday and it was it was quite something, quite painful, but enjoyable I guess. We can all walk so it's all good. Made no, it. Not sore today. Yeah. It's just hard. We did miss our goals but we still made it. We're still happy. Now the real training starts. That was a benchmark run. I don't know. Still the jury's out of running is for me. Hello Alta. Lynn? Good morning, guys. Welcome. Look at the beautiful weather we have here in Durban today. A beautiful spring morning, yeah. Into the last quarter of the year. October is upon us. So hopefully we have a little bit of less wind now and we can start heating up the pool waters. And hopefully they will open up the beaches before that, uh, before holidays. Are they closed? Beaches are, yeah, they've been closed. I must, I did see people swim in the ocean on on Saturday, but I'm not sure if it was legally or illegally. But um, yeah, so let's hope they do that. Morning, Pete. Morning, Robbie. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. Let's get out. What else do we need to say? Oh yes, um, next uh, next Sunday there won't be a broadcast. Next Sunday we won't be having a broadcast. So please just uh, remember that. Next Sunday morning at half past ten, no broadcast. <laughs> Please right? remember not to watch at <laughs> half past ten next yes, week. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Don't tune in. But uh, yeah, so it's holiday, so we're taking one Sunday off. Uh, it might go away a little bit. Anyway, so yeah, that's that's about it. Hello, Claudia. Nice to see you. All the way from Germany. Hi, yeah, you can. Yeah. Oops. Oh, can I ask if baby? I also need water, water, please, yeah, Dad. I didn't bring. Please, baby boy. This tap water is fine. Awesome. So, welcome back, Tori. Was that gone? You were gone last week. You were at the ballet exam. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's yes. so good to be back. Yeah. It's so nice to have you here. Keep me in line a bit. Well, Kick, I don't know. I she think... kicks me under the table when I say controversial things. I think you quite like being on your own. And then afterwards, she says, you know, you need to think about what you said there. <laughs> I said, I did think about it. That's why I said it. <laughs> Um, anyway, all right. I so think you like going rogue when I'm. I do play. actually. I do. I do. I play Coldplay in the background. Yo, um, I definitely keep you in line there. Yeah. Then. So we're in the Book of Romans, and it's been oh, a couple of weeks. Really enjoyed this little journey. Uh, relook, fresh look at Romans. Started in uh, Romans one, really, and today we're going to finish off Romans. Robbie's turning sixty on the sixth of what? Robbie, sixth of October. Okay, right. Send me an invite. That, Send that, me an invite. That is on the. Oh, it's on Thursday. Okay. Anyway, back to the back to Romans. <laughs> Today we're going to be doing Romans nine, ten, and eleven, and that kind of concludes the first eleven chapters of Romans, which is like one section of Romans, and the the rest of Romans, Romans twelve to the end, is more encouragement and and uh, ideas on practical living. So right. we might not cover all of that. Um, but we do want to thank you. We do want to go from uh, Romans 9 today. So to set up Romans 9, Paul took eight chapters uh, explaining to us that Jews and Gentiles ultimately really need the same thing. We're all really missing the mark. We need God to do something for us. Not even the law of Moses can really bring us into deliverance and salvation. You know, it can really do for us what God wants to do for us. 
And so that's why we, we look to Jesus to do something different than what the law of Moses did for us. Um, he goes on, and, and we spoke extensively about justification for all, morning wise men. We spoke about being dead to sin. Uh, we spoke about um, the ideas that we found in Romans 8, where, which were the ideas of now and that we are in the spirit. Now that we have a new way of thinking about life and have, have gotten God's mind on things, that we should now choose a different way of life, basically. But Romans 8 ends with a, a, a grand narrative where Paul really says, look, the reality is that all the things we're going through in this time does not compare to what God is going to do in us. Uh, Paul doesn't say there, it doesn't compare to what God has for us once we die. It's, it's, not the, it's, not the, it's not the context there. It's, his direct words are the glory that God wants to reveal within us. And the bonus of all of that is that he connects all of creation to it. And says that all of creation follows what humanity is busy growing into. And so, in my view, this is a, a grand narrative of all of the scriptures, actually. And what I like to call like a unified theory. Uh, it's, it's Paul saying, we, yes, we are suffering, but we have hope. Because we're hoping for something we can't see at the moment. God is busy doing something in humanity that's going to change everything. Right? Uh, and he uses metaphors like becoming sons and children of God and inheriting things from God and, and all, the, all, all the religious talk around it. But ultimately it's about the inner transformation of this amazing creature that God has made, humanity, and everything that's connected to it and the planet uh, that it's connected to. Um, so this is all grand and great. And there's just one obvious white elephant that stands in this theological room. And this is the simple question. If this is also great, why does Israel reject it? Like, why does Israel stick to the law? And why won't they receive this, what Paul calls earlier on, this free gift? Why won't they take this? And I think this is something, maybe to us it's not so important, but to Paul it was incredibly important. To, because it is like a, it's a dilemma. Like, why? If it's so great, Paul, like... Why are most of the Jews not taking to this? Uh, they prefer the law of Moses. Uh, they prefer the old covenant. They don't like the new covenant. They don't want it. So it's a, it is an important question to answer. And so that's what kind of happens in, in Romans 9 to 11. Romans 9 to 11 is about Israel, specifically about the Jews. Uh, the history with God. Uh, what happens now that they don't receive this? You know, what is, has God failed? Has Israel failed? Has Israel failed to uh, stumble to fall completely? Uh, what does the future of Israel look like? Um, that's kind of the questions that are answered in Romans 9 to 11. Morning, Paula. So um, what I would like to say before we quickly run through 9 to 11, and I'm, I really mean quickly, because it's quite a tricky piece, uh, these, these next three chapters. But I want to say at least this about it, that it, this is one of the, I think, the best portions in the Scripture, or in the New Testament Scriptures, where we see what the Bible actually is. Um, because many of us think that the Bible is, it's kind of like Paul sitting somewhere in a little room where there's a light coming through the window, and he's got the pen and the paper in front of him, and God gives him the words, like God says, okay, right now, then shall they be. Like, okay, then shall they be. No, no, not that word. Put another word in there. Mm. We kind of think that the Bible is the actual words of God. That, that, I think that's, that's how I, I grew up. To think that, you know, Paul was overtaken in a trance and just couldn't help but write these exact words. I think that's a, a fairly... Um, shallow view of what the scriptures really is and um, i think at the end of the day this is maybe a good way of saying it the bible is not and specifically the scriptures they are not god's words they are the words of people inspired by the word of god because the word of god is larger than the bible it has to be it's explained to us um, as something it was from the beginning it's explained to us as jesus himself um, so I think a good way to think about the Bible firstly is that it's not just one book written by God in God's words. It's, it's, it's not that. Um, it is a library. It's what Bible means. It's a library of book, books written over literally centuries of very, very different people living in very, very different times. And it's their own words 
inspired by God. And so if you know if you ask the question is the Bible the word of God? I believe it is, but I don't believe it is the word of God in the way that many Christians think it yeah. is. It's not God's actual Perfect. words. Mm -hmm. And Romans 9 to 11 is 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 a place where this is actually quite obvious and you need to disassociate yourself a little bit from the way you've always read it to see this. But the ways in which it becomes very apparent here in Romans 9 to 11 is this is like an internal dialogue. This is Paul asking questions and trying to answer those questions. There's about 20 questions and they're more concentrated around chapter 9, I think. Uh, sorry, around, yes, around chapter 9, but they extend into chapter 10, 11. Paul asks a, asks a question. For instance, one of them is, what if God did this to do that? Now, that's the, the format this takes. It's a person that has been changed by the life of Jesus that loves God and knows all the Old Testament scriptures and is trying to make sense of the life of Jesus and the gift that Jesus brings but in terms of what was written in the old and so Paul is here he's theorizing or if you like he's theologizing if there's a word like that about how do we make sense of Jesus and how do we make sense of the Jews that reject him and to paint that picture, he uses what I like to call the brush of the Old Testament. Because remember, the Old Testament brush is the, only, is the only real picture anybody understood at this time. The New Testament was not yet uh, developed in such a way, like for instance, in the way that we today have inherited a New Testament doctrine according to our tradition. It, was, it developed over much time, and, and this was really early. I mean, this was really, really early on. And so... This is, in my view, if you, if you read this with an open mind, you see that this is Paul trying to make sense of things. Paul contradicts himself uh, sometimes in here. And that's normal of someone that writes and says, I wonder if God meant this and that and that. And then later on he says, I don't think he did. I think what's going on here is this. It's like an internal dialogue happening in these chapters. Now, unless you have that view of these chapters, there's a lot of confusion coming your way here because there's a lot of stuff here that doesn't match. It doesn't match other parts of the scripture. It doesn't even match nicely together itself. It's only when thinking of this as a, a very important person, Paul, whose life has been changed by Jesus and the spirit of Jesus and the new covenant, trying to make sense under the yes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, trying to make sense of what's currently happening and the only brush he has to use to paint the New Testament grand portrait is the brush of the Old Covenant. Um, so I think if you can if you can stomach that, I know a lot of people are very against that type of view. I over the last couple of years have realized this is really the only view that makes sense of the scriptures. Um, if you don't take this type of approach you end up with an aggregate of the Bible that is always this side or that side and you can't really move forward with anything so what we're looking at here is and and paul actually at the end of this um just like he says in the book of corinthians he says we see in part i see in part we see in part we know in part just so at the end of this chapter in uh, of of these three uh, uh, book, uh chapters in in romans 11 he ends off by saying this is actually a mystery like who can actually know that's how this internal dialogue ends story mm -hmm. says who can actually know how god works and how he thinks and so it, it's quite evident to me here that paul is not trying to give us the exact absolute theology for what has happened paul is giving us his best inspired estimate with the with the data points yeah. of the old covenant he has to his exposure or his, his um uh, what's the right word uh, disposal um, but at, in the end at the end of Romans 11 he says you know what this is a mystery and who can really actually comprehend God or know what he does and why he does it um, uh, so all right so knowing that we're going to run through uh, Romans 9 to 11 uh, fairly briefly it's, it would not be possible to read all of it but Romans 9 starts with this um, Paul is he says, I'm sorrowful, I'm heavy in my heart because this is so amazing, but the Israelites are rejecting it. He said, my people, because he's from the tribe of Benjamin. He says, the new covenant or God that we see in Jesus is so amazing. He justifies us. He brings justification upon all men. He reconciles the world unto himself. But 
the Jews are rejecting it. Now, mm. so what do you make of that? Is did God fail? And actually, at one point, he says, "Did the words of God fail? Did the word, sorry, the word of God, did it fail? In other words, that which came to the Israelites through Moses and the prophets, did it fail? What's going to happen to the Jews?" And so this is how uh, chapter nine starts. It starts with this massive dilemma, and I, I would like to read verse four and five to you because it's part of the argument. He says, "The Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption." Um, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and of service uh, of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, their fathers mean the fathers of faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. And, then, and he, he makes even the point that, you know, Jesus came out of these people, if you think of him by the flesh. Um, all of these things belong to them. They had this huge advantage as, uh, 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 as being part of this process all along, right? Um, why have they not accepted it? It's a huge dilemma. It's the white elephant in the room. And what Paul then does is he, for the next couple of verses, uh, probably from verse uh, 6 all the way through to verse 29 of chapter 9, as Paul now takes, and this is my way of explaining it, Paul takes the old covenant brush. The, the, the Torah's brush and he tries to paint or tries to make sense of a new covenant picture with an older brush and I think you need to keep that in mind and, and there's many reasons for that but if you don't you're going to bring the old covenant as part of the, the new covenant if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not careful um, so he takes now he takes the examples of Abraham Abraham's sons Isaac and Ishmael then he takes Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau. Um, and then he goes as far down to Moses and Pharaoh. And he's trying to explain that, look, during this process, there was always those who rejected things and those who accepted things. So he says, look, and, 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 and from his perspective, he's saying, no, no. He's saying God chose Isaac instead of uh, Ishmael. Right? Ishmael did nothing for this. But Isaac was the son of promise. Uh, God chose Jacob instead of Esau. This also is almost upside down because it, it, Jacob was the heel catcher. Like he was the, the, the initial betrayer. Then he goes on to say, you know, God chose Moses and not Pharaoh. Uh, and, and Paul uses, and, and throughout all these, chip, all these verses here, Paul quotes uh, from the Old Covenant. So that's why I'm saying he uses an Old Covenant brush. Now, one of the reasons why... I believe he uses the old covenant brushes. For instance, in verse 15 of chapter 9, Paul quotes a very, very important portion of the Torah. In fact, I believe this is absolutely central to the understanding of God through the constitution of the old covenant, which we find in the Torah. And Paul quotes in verse 15, he says, for, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll be gracious to whom I uh, want to be gracious or be compassionate to those who I want to be compassionate to. Now, this you might, if you, if you read it in isolation here, you might not think much of it. But if you go back, and I, I would encourage you to do so, to go back and find where we find this portion. This is very much, I believe this, this brush is uniquely Old Covenant brush. It's a brush that says, God has mercy upon whom he will have mercy. But that's not, that doesn't explain what this means properly. Um, but if you go back into the book of Exodus, um, Exodus 20, verse 5 to 6, you find this in the middle of the Old Covenant law. It's actually part of the Ten Commandments in Exodus. Um, and then you find it again in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9 to 10. It's repeated in the second law. But also it's found when Moses asked God to show him his glory. He goes into the cleft of a rock, as the, as the account goes, and God comes behind him and mentions these same things again. And I want to just quickly go, and I want to read the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic um, version to give you an idea of what does it mean, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Uh, good morning, Seppi. So this is what it meant to the Israelites. This is what it meant to Moses. Um, it meant this. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with them that love him and keeps uh, his covenant uh, and keeps his commandment to a thousand generations. So the first part of this is this. God is merciful on those that love him 
and keeps his commandments. Okay, that sounds amazing. Okay, but here's the other side of all of this. And repays them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. So this is what we find in the old covenant. We find, and I like to call this God according to Moses. God according to Moses is someone who loves those who love him and hate those who hate him. And if you go and read the Old Covenant uh, curses, Old Covenant blessings, you realize that this is further explained by, look, if you love God, it's going to go well with you. But if you don't, literally, he will, he will destroy you. So this is an Old Covenant brush that I believe we don't see in the life of Jesus. I believe that Jesus is a progression out from that because Jesus is one that forgives those who hurts him. He, he asks us to bless those who curse us, pray for them who curse us. And so I think that coming with an old covenant brush here and painting it onto the New Testament um, <coughs> is going to be a problem unless we recognize it for what it is. Paul is describing the New Testament to Jews who only know the Old Testament. They only know the Old Testament and the way that God was described uh, uh, by Moses in the Old Testament. So when we come to the New Testament, we know that things are slightly different. Mm. So it will not surprise you then that this book ends not with God only has mercy on some. But in fact, and this is the title of today, uh, God has mercy upon all. Those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who obey and those who don't obey. So don't get... Don't get caught here by taking this little piece here in isolation and say, you see, some have been made for destruction and some have been made for glory. And God before the time have decided you guys are for destruction and you guys are for glory. And, and this is, I mean, this is the strong push of Calvinism out of which um, our family in, in two, two to three generations back come from. The idea that God decides before the time who gets what, who goes where, and that we really don't have free will at all. Now, I reject that notion um, very, very strongly. I believe in free will. I, I think love cannot really exist without free will. I think without free will, the idea of love is absolutely absurd and untenable. Uh, and so because love is such a huge portion of what the Bible is, what Jesus is and what Jesus says God is, I think that to think of God in such a way is actually misunderstanding God. At the same time, I will, I will give in to the idea that Moses probably did think like this. Mm. Um, I'm quite happy to admit that I think Moses probably did like this. I just did think like this. I will also admit that Paul probably was struggling between two things. Between Moses who thought like this and Jesus who seemed to not think like this. Um, so, okay. So what we find in chapter 9 from about verse 6 to verse 29 is Paul trying to explain really he's, he's trying to explain a central issue the central issue is why doesn't all of Israel jump at this new covenant and so he's trying to explain in old covenant language that not everybody jumps at it we never saw that in the old testament we seem to saw that in God's journey with Israel it was never everyone jumping on it in fact in the old covenant you might you might be forgiven to think that it's always the minor the minority it's always a very small, select minority that jumps at the gifts God puts on the table. Paul calls this the election. Because in Paul's view, it seems that God in his foreknowledge knew that there were always going to be some only very small portion that was going to do it. And Paul tries to add to this here that it's not because that small portion is so great. But ultimately, it's, it's because of God's enablement, right? Okay, so it's, a it's a big theological push here that we don't really want to get into. But the center of this is Paul makes the point, guys, it's never really been any other way in Israel. There's always been a small minority that jumps to the things that God wants. Um, and if you know a bit of the Old Testament, you'll know that this is, this is normally, normally the truth here. Um, so that's kind of what chapter 9 is about. Um, he also finalizes this thought by referring to Isaiah in, in verse 27. And he says, even Isaiah prophesied that there will always be a small remnant. And this is where the word remnant comes from. A small portion that remains to take on the gift that God puts on the table. So Paul uses the, the Old Testament framework. He uses the Old Testament brush to try and explain why the entire Israel is not jumping on board to, uh, of, 
uh, on the, not jumping on board of the new covenant as they should because they had such a huge 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 advantage um, then in chapter 10 the central theme of chapter 10 could really be found in verse 4 where Paul makes a statement he says for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes and so Paul makes an emphatic statement that because of Jesus, because of Christ, the anointed one that has come, trying to find righteousness through the law, there's, it's, it, that dispensation has actually ended. Mm. Um, it's not possible. Uh, the Jews, they spend all their lives trying to fulfill the law um, and it, it, it just didn't work. Like It actually ended up in disaster, disaster uh, to some degree. And Paul then continues on in chapter 10, uh, speaking about how now things come by faith and he, how he has been sent to preach to people so people can hear and so people can start trusting in this gift that God has given humanity, right? He's speaking about faith that comes by hearing. I know you've heard that verse many, many, many times, verse 17 of chapter 10. Then in chapter 11, um, in chapter 11, there's many questions. And Paul writes, and what is, what is interesting is to the point of my earlier saying that this is kind of like an internal dialogue put on paper. It's almost Socratic in some way that it's, it's trying to lead us by only asking questions. Um, and Paul repeatedly in, verse, in chapter 11 says, but I say, I say, I say, I feel, I see it like this. You know, it, it, it is weird. And, and, and if you, you know, the way we want the Bible to be is we want God to, to use, we want Paul to use the exact word, the exact word of God's. Uh, sorry, the exact words of God, and then this would have looked very, very different. It would just be God says, or this is what God says, or, but, but this is very clearly Paul saying, this is what I see, and and I feel like this is what we need to look at. These are the things we need to consider, etc. So, chapter eleven is also a very difficult, difficult question. Now that the Israelites, most of them, are choosing, let's say the Jews for, it's a more practical, uh, more, more accurate uh, word. The Jews are rejecting God. Is God rejecting the Jews now? Like, what's going to happen to those who reject Jesus? Like, and, and the actual word is this. He says in verse 1 of chapter 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? Now, in the larger sense, like the Jews. And then Paul says, no, he hasn't. You see, to most of us in our... In our normal way of thinking, um, they rejected Jesus, they bound for hell or something. But here's Paul coming and saying, he says, I know they haven't accepted Jesus, but God hasn't cast them away. Like yeah. there's, there's, there's something else going on here. And from really from chapter 11, we see Paul's thought pattern starting to swing towards it. it, it it's like he oscillates between they doomed, but they not. They've lost everything, but they haven't. Uh, they've stumbled, but they didn't stumble to eventually fall. They rejected Christ, but they will receive mercy. He oscillates between these two thoughts all the time. Um, and so he speaks about the remnant again. Um, he calls it the remnant of grace. He speaks about the idea that Israel actually was just blinded for a time. Um, and then in verse 11 of chapter 11, he asks the question, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, did they stumble to fall? Like, um, just, I'm thinking of myself while I'm running, I often trip over these little cat eyes. Sometimes I stumble, other times I fall. Like I fall quite badly. Um, so I don't lift my feet up properly while I'm running. But he's making the point here that yes, they've stumbled, but no, they actually haven't fallen. Um, and so he's trying to answer the question, what happens to those who reject Jesus altogether? Of which the Jews is a beautiful example. Um, but I actually believe we could extrapolate this to anybody that says, I don't accept Jesus. I don't accept this gift of justification. I don't accept it. What does that mean for that person? Does it mean that that person has stumbled to fall completely? Uh, what happens uh, to that person? Anyway, um, then he starts using things like, he says, if the fall, in verse 12, he says, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. In other words, through their disobedience and their unbelief and their rejection of God's gift, um, God has given us riches now as 
as Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So suddenly now he's talking about their fullness, the fullness of people who have completely stumbled at the cross, you know, who really, uh, as, as Paul says in, other place, in another place, Christ the stumbling stone truly became a stumbling block for them. They, they actually rejected that stone. Um, and then he goes on in, in chapter 11 from verse 13 about the olive tree and how they can be grafted back in and how we should be careful uh, not to judge them etc um, but it's really in chapter 20 uh, verse 11 from verse 25 uh, chapter 11 from verse 25 to 36 that we see Paul concluding the thought so be very careful of just reading ver chapter 9 and 10 in isolation you're gonna you're gonna it's like it's like reading it's like watching half the movie and coming to conclusions you have to read and include chapter 11 very much so because Paul is actually busy arguing. He's, he's actually arguing with himself. He's mm. like, it's an internal dialogue about what now? Mm. What do we do with all of this? And that internal dialogue I counted, there's at least 20 questions, 20 times where Paul says, for instance, one of them is um, uh, a little bit early on in chapter nine. He says, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction now number one this is an old covenant brush he's using but number two he's not making a theological state mm. he's saying what if what if what if what if so he's he's he's, he's throwing questions at the reader who was the romans uh, uh, the roman christians or the christians in rome and and saying guys have you thought about this have you thought about this don't just dismiss israel altogether don't just dismiss or even judge the jews for rejecting God is busy with something. Um, he now makes the statement like this in verse 25, and this is the concluding, and, and really this, this thought pattern ends, it seems at least to us, at the end of this chapter 11. And then verse chapter 12 starts with a completely new thought and its exhortation to practical living. So this is how all of this ends. He says uh, in verse uh, 25 of chapter 11, For I would not, brothers, that you be ignorant of the mystery. In other words, guys, it's not so obvious. You can't just take the old covenant brush, brush it over this new situation and come to your own conclusions. It's not as simple as God just kills and destroys everyone who don't like him. It's not as simple as God just showing mercy to those who love him. It's God is not, that's not the best brush with which we should be painting uh, God. And I, I think maybe Paul did think of God in this way until he met Jesus in Damascus and was completely converted and and uh, convicted by the life of Jesus suddenly he had to go rethink all of his theology in terms of the life of Jesus in terms of in, in essence for Christians God on the cross not doing anything to those who are hurting him and busy crucifying him so um, he says now don't be ignorant this is it's kind of like a mystery um, don't be wise in your own ideas um, he says because yes a blindness did happen in part to in to 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 Israel but then he uses the word until and so he says look it's not all lost for Israel because they have rejected Jesus there's something else deeper going on here there's another fullness that's coming and this is only an until um, and so yes there'd be consequences for the Jews and Israel um, to some degree, you know, some people like to think of the fall of Jerusalem as a, as a natural consequence of their disregard for the words of Jesus who warned them that this was going to happen. Um, you know, I'm not sure how you would weave that in exactly, but salvation in the New Testament is not only about, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not really just about becoming part of a club. It's, it's also actual salvation being delivered from Roman oppression and, and, and what happened in the fall of Jerusalem. Um, it says in verse 26, and this is even more confusing. He says, and so all Israel shall be saved. Like, Paul, what are you actually talking about? Um, you've just told us these oaks have rejected everything. Now you're telling us that there's, although they might have natural consequences early on, there's an ultimate position for them. That's a salvation type position. What does this, you know, what does this actually mean? Um, and then Paul Paul calls back the old covenant again. He says, because God promised that he would wash them clean in the new covenant. As he, he calls on new covenant portions in the old covenant to say God promised he will wash them clean. 
uh, by the, deliver the deliverer that'll come out of Zion. And here you have Jesus, who they've rejected, but is still the one who saves them. That, that's weird. It's strange. It's counterintuitive. Uh, but it is telling us about maybe Paul is landing at the end of this 11th chapter. The picture, he's completing the picture he started early on, which was justification for all. Um, he says, for this is my comment unto them. I will take away their sins. Um, and then verse 28 goes like this. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So he's saying like, okay, so they are our enemies. He says, but wait on. Touching the election, they are the beloved for the Father's sake. And I think what Paul is doing here, and this is what I see in here. I see, I see Paul saying, love your enemies. That's what's going on here. He says, you consider these people enemies because they don't hold or trust the gospel. But listen, God loves them. They are beloved of God. And ultimately, the New Testament lands on the love for neighbor, but also the love for enemies. So he does not declare them the enemies of God who God will destroy according to the old covenant brush, the ideas that Moses had. But he paints them as you might consider them as enemies, but they are beloved by God and you should love them, right? Um, for the gifts and the calling of God is without repentance. Now listen to verse 30 to 33 to 32, because I think this is actually critical. He says, for as in times past, you, you didn't believe God in the actual word there means you didn't obey God. Yet now you've obtained mercy. Yes, okay, fine. Um, and he says this was because of their disobedience allowed your disobedience to become and, and to receive mercy. And then he goes to the second one and he says, So now also these, they are now in disobedience, that through your mercy they might also obtain mercy. Now what I see here is very simple. I don't believe Paul is using the Old Testament brush here. I think he's using the New Testament brush here. Because he is now not saying some will get mercy and some will not. He's actually saying that even though they were obedient, they will receive mercy. Mm. Even though you were obedient, you will receive mercy. And that to me is a simple picture of the new covenant reality. God extends his mercy to all. God extends his mercy to all. So rather than view chapter 9 in isolation, coming to Old Testament, Old Covenant conclusions that God loves those who He loves, uh, and He loves those who love Him, and He will destroy those uh, who hate Him. The New Covenant conclusions look different. It's a progression in the understanding of who God is, that actually God extends mercy to all. Uh, and your disobedience or your you're missing the mark as we met earlier in the book of Romans, cannot separate you anymore from the extension and the embrace of God, even if you are Jewish, and even if you shouted crucify him, because that's really what's going on here. So uh, in, in Christian history, we have taken many of these portions here in, in Romans 9 in isolation and actually persecuted the Jews. Because we believe they were the enemies of God. But if we read 19 and 11 together, Paul is going somewhere with this argument. He is saying, in the end, you might consider them enemies, but you should love them because they are loved by God. And remember that God extends mercy to all. Um, verse 32 ends like this. For God has not concluded or included them all in disobedience. That he, for God, excuse me, for God has included them all in obedience that he might have mercy upon all and so what this tells me is i mean if you can read it a hundred times but you're going to get to a type of a conclusion that looks like disobedience is no longer a disqualification for the mercy and the grace of god which is the resource the abundant infinite resource from which god says come here i embrace everyone and as what the bible calls justification and then Paul ends like this. I'm just going to read this for you. Verse 33 to 36. And then we're done today. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. In other words, Paul makes the point here that this is fascinating. Mm. And even though the Old Testament talks about God rejecting everyone that disobeys him and only accepting those who love him, here we have something else panning out 
and then he then he starts to describe this mercy it's it's uh uh it's a depth of riches it's a it's a wisdom and knowledge that's unsearchable uh, and his judgments and his ways are past finding out and so you have to put this in if you if you truly believe that this is inspired by god you have to include this that paul is actually making an admission that it's not possible for him as paul to know exactly how all of this pan out he's giving us an inspired version according to his context according to his understanding of the scripture and his influence and his life influ influenced by the love of jesus but ultimately he concludes we don't we're not it's it's we cannot really understand yeah. it all uh, right um and so i think just the point is that we need to be careful not to push god into an old testament box when the new testament writers are quite clear that this thing is really mysterious in its way and it might look very much different than what we at first or they at first concluded through the old testament scriptures um he says for who has known the mind of the lord who has been uh, who has been his counselor he's starting to sound like job now starting to sound like um, solomon in the proverbs or who has given to him first that he now shall get a reward for that giving verse 36 ends like this for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever amen so we end up with the idea of all things and i i think next time which is not going to be next week but uh, the week after next, I want to speak about the all things, Paul's idea of all things. And it's found right throughout Paul's writings in the New Testament. And I want to try and string them together to form a picture from them. Um, but I want to leave you with this today. That Romans 19 and 11 is not a confirmation that God hates those who hate him and loves those who love him. And therefore will only have mercy on those who love him and will show absolutely no mercy but hate and destruction according to Exodus and Deuteronomy, on those who hate him. But chapters 9 to 11 of Paul is Paul on the basis of bringing the ideas of justification for everyone. Yeah. No more condemnation because of the gift of God. Trying to make sense of how could the Jews not accept this gift. And although if we judge the Jews by their own covenant, they are doomed. But Paul's find the conclusion is not like that he's saying they not mercy for that even the disobedient how can this be who has thought who has who knows how god works who knows the depth of the riches of this mercy and grace that he has towards us um and so i think as as christians today we need to be careful how we read the scriptures we need to be careful of putting god into an old testament box i think we'll make a huge mistake to think number one that paul thought of god in the same way that moses did i think there's a there's not that it's not like that i'm not saying paul didn't quote moses he quoted him a lot because it was his was his context yeah. but he was using an old testament brush to paint a new brand new picture that nobody had any way of understanding and so what do you do you use the tools you have use the metaphors you have use the scripture you have to try and piece together the picture of an all-loving god of a god that gives freely without accept, uh, expecting anything back or without expecting something in the first place like allegiance or some form of blind um, uh, slave obedience i think god might be different and i think the life of paul um, in all of paul's writing this is what i see paul does this and he does this excellently is he paints the picture of the new covenant in terms of old covenant brushes and colors tries to create a picture and a portrait of the revelation of God through the life of Jesus but using Old Testament scripture so at the end of Romans 11 we come to the conclusion that God might not be thinking the way we thought he was thinking we come to the conclusion that Paul is saying that he doesn't really know and he, it's actually impossible for him to know exactly how God thinks about all of this but here are his thoughts um, mercy upon all so I leave you with that today you are included in that uh, no matter where you find yourself today uh, the embrace of God is irrevocable the embrace of God comes without condition the love of God 
is unconditional in that sense that not that it doesn't in a love relationship you might have conditions for other aspects of the life or the relationship but the love the flow of love from one party to the other in a love relationship that actual flow has no boundary when it comes from a god who is love yes. uh, i know me and you in our love relationships in your marriage you might have some boundaries and conditions for your love but the love that comes from God does not abide by conditions. Um, that doesn't mean that God does, does not want us to be A, B, C and D or act like this, that or that. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying that the love that flows truly is unconditional. And this is what Romans 9 to 11, this is what Romans 1 to 11, I believe, is saying to the Roman Christians and the Jewish Christians. You're all the same before God, no matter whether you have the law of Moses or not. It's something you anyway have to move out and from because Christ is the end of that way the new way is this that just as one man brought us into this dilemma now one man has taken us out mm. there are no more conditions to the love of God for our lives have a wonderful Sunday remember no broadcast next week we'll see you the week after have a lovely week and uh, there is nothing that can separate us yes. from God's love and there is nothing you can do that can make distance between you and God. There is no ceiling that can contain your conversations and you pouring out your heart to you. Now, thank you so much. Thanks, Have guys. a nice week. Bye.